Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Taylor Wood and I'm the Associate Dean of Development for the School of Medicine Basic Sciences at Vanderbilt University. I'll be serving as your moderator today. First, I want to thank all of you for attending. We're thrilled to have you with us today for this really exciting presentation. A quick item of housekeeping. There's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. It's the little um, chat boxes with Q&A underneath them. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them there. Uh, once we reach the end of the presentation, we'll do our best to provide answers to them. Now I'm here to introduce Dr. Larry Marnett, Dean of Basic Sciences at the School of Medicine at Vanderbilt University. In addition to being Dean of our school, Dr. Marnett is Director of the A.B. Hancock Jr. Memorial Laboratory for Cancer Research, Mary Geddes Stallman Professor of Cancer Research, and a Professor of Biochemistry, Chemistry, and Pharmacology. He's been at Vanderbilt since 1989 and Dean of the school since his creation in 2016. Larry, take it away. Thank you, Taylor, and welcome to today's presentation by Jeff Hahn and Craig Lindsley. As Taylor said, I'm the Dean of the School of Medicine Basic Sciences, which was created four years ago as part of the VU VUMC reorganization. The School of Medicine Basic Sciences has roughly the same number of faculty as the School of Engineering and Peabody College. We're comprised of four departments, each of which was founded around 1925, along with eight centers and a number of outstanding research core facilities. We also have one of the best PhD training programs in the biomedical sciences in the US. We are an extremely research active school and have the second largest budget in the university with approximately 60% of our funding coming from research grants. Our faculty are dedicated to fundamental discovery science, trying to understand how biological systems work and how they go wrong in disease. A unique aspect of our school is that we have truly exceptional facilities for taking our discoveries from the bench into the clinic. We have great strengths in neuroscience drug discovery, but apply our technologies to many other clinical problems as well. Today, you'll hear a presentation by Jeff Kahn and Craig Lindsley, who lead our neuroscience drug discovery program. This is without a doubt the best academic drug discovery program in the United States. And as you'll see, Jeff and Craig have taken biological concepts of how the brain works and developed them into targets for drug action. Jeff Kahn received his PhD in pharmacology from Vanderbilt, then did postdoctoral work at Yale. He began his independent research career at Emory in the Department of Pharmacology, ascending the ranks to professor. In 2000, Jeff moved to Merck as director of neuroscience, where he learned the process of drug discovery. We were very fortunate to recruit him to Vanderbilt in 2003 to set up a program in translational neuropharmacology that eventually became the Vanderbilt Center for Neuroscience Drug Discovery. Jeff's research interests are very broad and concern pathways of neural excitation and their modulation by small molecule agents. He is currently the Lee Limburg Professor of Pharmacology. Craig Lindsley received his PhD in chemistry from the University of California, Santa Barbara, then did postdoctoral work at Harvard. He held positions at Park Davis and Lilly before joining the research staff at Merck. At Merck, Craig developed an exciting and robust technology for synthesizing drug-like molecules that enabled up to 75 to 100 compounds to be made at once and purified in parallel. This dramatically increases the speed of optimization of chemical structure for biological activity that is absolutely the heart of the drug discovery process. Craig joined the faculty at Vanderbilt in 2006 as Director of Medicinal Chemistry for the VCNDB, and he is now co-director of the center and William K. Warren, Professor of Pharmacology and University Professor of Pharmacology, Chemistry and Biochemistry. Jeff and Craig are incredibly productive scientists who have won many, many awards. In the interest of time, I'm not going to list any of them, but I want to state that they have created something very, very special at Vanderbilt that distinguishes them and the university from any other academic institution in the country. I would also like to point out that the William K. Warren Foundation has provided significant amounts of funding for their research, especially as it moved toward the clinic. The foundation recently endowed the center 
with a very, very generous gift that resulted in changing the name to the Warren Center for Neuroscience Drug Discovery. So Jeff, if you'll begin the presentation, please. Great, thank you very much, Larry. And uh, thank you all for being on this, uh, this call and, and uh, learning about the Warren Center for Neuroscience Drug Discovery. I think all of you that are on this call uh, know how ravaging and, and difficult brain disease can be and how much of an impact it is having in our country and world. And when you look at the World Health Organization's list of the top 10 uh, causes of disability, uh, six of those 10 are brain diseases. So brain diseases are having a, a dramatic impact and the top is major depression. Uh, and then others of those six include schizophrenia, uh, other major brain disorders, addictive disorders, et cetera. So this is a set of disorders that impacts everyone on the planet. I think everyone who's attending this call uh, has in some way been impacted by uh, brain disease and, and sees the need for new treatments. So if we can go to the next slide, uh, this is just to illustrate how far we have come in our understanding of the brain and understanding of biological systems that have direct relevance for development of new uh, treatment strategies that are so desperately needed. Uh, at the turn of the century, we uh, completed the sequence of the human genome. So we now have the genetic code for every possible drug target that exists in the human body. We have, uh, we have technologies that allow us to image brain activity and function in various uh, modalities uh, in disease brain and in healthy brain to see what has gone awry in disease. And then at the molecular and even uh, uh, atomic level, we have the ability to image proteins that are drug targets and how a small molecule that could be a drug uh, interacts with that protein to help us design better molecules that would have uh, the ability to move forward into humans. And on the bottom left, this is just to illustrate how much we're learning about how genetics interfaces with environment to lead to different uh, brain diseases. And that gives us the opportunity to start to tailor medicines and treatments for individuals. Uh, instead of bucketing all of these treatments into one category, we can start to really understand the nuances and think about medicines that would be uh, appropriate for an individual and their specific uh, disease and, and needs. Uh, next slide. The thing that is discouraging is despite these advances, which have been tremendous, uh, we are not seeing the advances that we would like to see in terms of translation of these advances in our understanding of the brain and brain function and disease into new treatments. So when we look at the treatments that are available for major brain disorders, uh, most of those treatments have uh, been available since the 1960s or uh, small variations on those early drugs. And it, it, there are a few uh, exceptions to that, but for the most part, it is uh, modest incremental advances relative to drugs that were discovered long ago, well before we had the understanding that we do today of brain function. And what that has led to is multiple drug companies pulling out of neuroscience. So there has been a, a, an exodus of the pharmaceutical industry from neuroscience because of the sense that uh, this is an area that is too risky. It's too difficult to develop molecules that get into the brain, uh, interact with the appropriate target, have the effects, and our understanding of brain function and how that relates to disease is still at a level that makes that drug discovery and development process uh, very difficult. So many companies have pulled out, and this uh, at the bottom of this slide is just a quote by a, a writer in Forbes, uh, that neuroscience is increasingly being abandoned by big pharmaceutical com country, companies. And obviously psychiatry drugs have been especially hard hit. So that's where we at the WCNDD saw a need that simply has to be met. We can't sit back and, and allow this increase in knowledge to, to languish and not be translated into new treatments. If we can see the next slide. So this slide just shows the process involved in discovering and developing a new medicine. And I don't wanna go into this in any detail at all, but, but all I want to do is use this to illustrate 
that there are multiple steps that are very complex, very difficult. The first is where academic institutions historically, traditionally have been most active and involved, and that's simply identifying a new target for a potential drug uh, that has the potential. But that's the first step in many ways. Uh, it, it's the, the uh, in terms of drug discovery, it's the least expensive step. I, I think it depends on how you view that target identification. It's a critical step, but nonetheless, it's one small part of a much bigger process. And then you go through this list, each of these steps of validating that target, showing that it really is, it does have utility for treatment of a disease, identifying molecules that interact with that target, then optimizing those through this very difficult, intense process uh, to the point where they can be used in humans safely and effectively. Uh, and then going into the regulatory studies that the FDA and other regulatory agencies require before you can enter clinical development, and then finally into clinical testing. And this entire process requires about 12 to 14 years. Uh, and one thing that I think is important to keep in mind when you just think of the sheer economics of this process is that uh, many of these compounds have to be patented at the first step in those first couple of years. Uh, and the patent life is only 20 years. So from an industry perspective, you can understand why companies have begun to uh, pull out and de-emphasize neuroscience drug discovery. But again, academic institutions do a terrific job at that first step of target identification. And then once a compound is at the point where it's in clinical trials, uh, academic institutions often play a part in that as well. Next slide. The cost of this process is staggering. So today the cost of any new drug that makes it to the market is uh, in excess of $2 billion. And again, from an economic and business perspective, you can see why there's a tremendous risk. And of those that make it all the way to the market, only three out of every 10 drugs that make it to the market uh, actually bring enough sales to pay for their own discovery and development. So it's a high risk, uh, high stakes uh, area, and, uh, and there has to be a high level of comfort before a company can really invest in, in this major investment to go all the way to a new treatment. Next slide. So seeing this problem is what motivated us to, to really begin to rethink the way that drug discovery and development happens within the biomedical research community. There's always been a process by which academic institutions uh, begin basic science studies around a possible area and then depend solely on companies to take those discoveries and move them forward into clinical trials and ultimately to the market. Uh, what we, we began to understand through our working in both academic and industry environments that that is that that system is fundamentally uh, broken. And I could spend a lot of time talking about why that is and some of the things that uh, make that system difficult in today's climate. But nonetheless, it, it became clear to us that there is a need to build drug discovery in an academic setting where you can approach that in a way that is fundamentally different from what's done in pharmaceutical companies. And the goal is to de-risk fundamentally new approaches that uh, could be used for the treatment of serious brain disorders, as you see in our mission statement. So to do that, you can't just begin to do the type of work that has always been done in universities or that's always been done in, in industry. You have to build from the ground up a new approach to science that includes the best practices from industry and fully enmeshes those with the best practices from uh, top level academic research. And so that's what we have done in, in the uh, Warren Center for Neuroscience Drug Discovery and building really what is in some ways looks like a biotech within a university, but it's a biotech that operates in a different manner in which we, we integrate that drug discovery with very high level science. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just to give an example of that, and I'll go through this quickly so we can uh, turn it over to Craig to, to talk some more about some of the programs that we have and some of our successes. Uh, but this is a program that we began very early, the first year that I moved here and uh, uh, 
And when Craig and I were both at uh, Merck, it was a program that we we discussed uh, at length and, and had a major interest in starting that as soon as we moved to Vanderbilt. And this is a new approach for treatment of Parkinson's disease uh, in which we were building on surgical approaches. So without going into the details, deep brain stimulation of a certain area of the brain called the subthalamic nucleus is highly effective in treatment of Parkinson's disease. And the way that that acts is it decreases excessive activity at a specific synapse or, or circuit in the brain that's involved in controlling voluntary movement. So from that knowledge, surgical techniques have been developed to uh, decrease that excessive activity. And there's a video here uh, that illustrates that. This is a patient at Emory University when I was there that was really, uh, in, her story inspired me to begin thinking of this from pharmacology. So these early pictures are Sybil when, before she developed Parkinson's disease. And then this is a picture of her with a very early onset, severe Parkinson's disease where she became completely immobilized and uh, incapable of, of uh, caring for herself, couldn't feed herself uh, normally, could not walk without assistance. She's now going into surgery for on one side of her brain to reduce this excessive activity. And this was being pioneered at that time at Emory uh, when, when this video was developed. And what you can see is after that, surgery on one side of the brain. She can now stand unaided. She can walk across the room uh, without assistance. Now she goes in for bilateral surgery on the other side of the brain. And this is Sybil after that bilateral surgery. So it is a phenomenal uh, gain of improvement. And for all intents and purposes, Sybil's life has been given back to her. She was at the end of the road with normal treatment with, uh, for Parkinson's disease and was no longer responsive to available medicines. I apologize for how choppy that video was. It, uh, I think on the Zoom, uh, the, the speed of Zoom, it, it, it chopped it up, but I think you could still see the overall impact that this surgery had on uh, Sybil. So for us, we began to think about this brain circuit, not from a surgical perspective, but from a pharmacological perspective. Could we identify drug targets that would allow us to have the same effect to reduce this excessive activity uh, with a drug that could be swallowed as a pill, get into the brain and have this effect? And the next slide just goes straight to the end of that process uh, after moving to uh, Vanderbilt, we were able to obtain funding from the National Institutes of Health and the Fox Foundation gave a major uh, investment into this program to allow us to launch a full drug discovery effort. Uh, the Atticus Trust here in Nashville, Betty and Martin Brown family were also major uh, contributors to this program and they actually stepped in at a key point where we needed funds to do a certain uh, set of studies to allow us to advance this further. And then if you'll click the slide again, what that culminated in is the launch of a company that's a Nashville-based company, Apello Pharmaceuticals, that is now advancing this, uh, this drug that we have developed, drug candidate that we've developed into clinical testing uh, in Parkinson's patients. So it's a real example of a success of taking this very early idea at its most nascent stages and moving that forward to the point that we're about to be able to uh, find out if this really will have the impact we want in Parkinson's patients. Next slide. So what you'll hear about, among other things from Craig, is, uh, is another example of a compound that, is, that we developed called VU319 that's developed for treatment of Alzheimer's disease and also cognitive deficits in schizophrenia where instead of launching a company or partnering with a company, we decided to go further uh, internally at Vanderbilt. And that's something that is unique to Vanderbilt in terms of the ability to do that. Because we have such a terrific clinical research center, uh, great relationships with our colleagues in the Department of Psychiatry, and then we were able to hire uh, consultants on the regulatory side, we were able to advance this all the way into clinical testing have just completed a clinical trial of what we call phase one, the first of three major phases of clinical testing uh, that has been highly successful. And that then led to a partnership with a company called Acadia uh, that we are now working with to advance this all the way through 
uh, clinical testing and hopefully to the market for treatment of schizophrenia patients and Alzheimer's patients. Next slide. So just to sum up, what we have done is we've, we have taken this, uh, you know, these steps and this approach to drug discovery that is implemented throughout the pharmaceutical industry and have, have really reevaluated the traditional academic role so that we now view academics role as not simply identifying a target, uh, but go to the next slide, we now work around, along this entire continuum all the way to clinical development, uh, oftentimes in partnership with uh, pharmaceutical companies to take the best ideas that could, could have a fundamental impact on treatment of brain disease and uh, move those forward into treatment. So the, this process is called the Valley of Death, and that's what this cartoon illustrates. Uh, and we've really been working hard to bridge that valley and, and are making tremendous strides in being able to accomplish that. Next slide, please. So, so this is just to show, without going into detail on our pipeline, these are our major programs that are currently underway. And we have programs that range from clinical development, like the M1-PAMs, uh, to those that are in very early stages of uh, just validating a new approach, showing that it is, is appropriate. Uh, and this range uh, reaches across a broad range of neuroscience-related diseases, schizophrenia, Parkinson's disease, uh, Rett syndrome, uh, addictive disorders, et cetera. So really excited to see this uh, happening in uh, an academic environment here at Vanderbilt. The uh, companies listed below are some of our major partners that are now working with us to advance, especially these more advanced programs that are moving towards clinical development. So I will stop it there and uh, turn it over to Craig, who can talk about some of the uh, examples of of some of our successes. Uh, Craig, I think you're muted. Ah, ah. Well, hello, welcome. Uh, I'm just gonna pick up where Jeff left off and go a little more depth on some of our projects. And um, as Jeff mentioned, for many years, we were known as the Vanderbilt Center for Neuroscience Drug Discovery. Uh, I think it, it helped Vanderbilt get, get a lot of recognition based on the success of the center. And that's where we were up until early 2020 when the William K. Warren Foundation, as Jeff mentioned, gave us a, a very generous endowment uh, and we changed the name to the Warren Center for Neuroscience Drug Discovery. Uh, next slide. Um, so why do we want to do this in academia? That's a question we get asked quite a bit. And as Jeff pointed out, uh, especially in the neuroscience field, most major pharma have exited neuroscience. Uh, it's still a major medical need. And, and even more importantly than that, most of the pharmacology and the biology behind targets, uh, all the low hanging fruit is gone. The, the biology is much more complicated. And so to do this in an industrial setting where you have very short uh, timelines and, and business needs, it's not really the ideal environment to develop a story and really understand the the systems you're trying to, to modulate and understand what a small molecule needs to look like uh, to be successful and to avoid uh, adverse effects. Doing this in a university setting is ideal. Uh, we can invest time in all stages. We can be really focused on science, not again, the business pressures. Uh, and at the same time, as, as we saw uh, pretty much from 2008 to about 2016, there was a big downturn in big pharma and so we've been able to recruit and hire a lot of seasoned drug discovery sciences across disciplines, which has been really important. And as a result of that, NIH has, has launched uh, a lot of new translational research opportunities, really focused on drug discovery, drug development, uh, with more of a focus on intellectual property and developing patents um, to license more so than publications. And our center has been, uh, as well as Vanderbilt and Hull, has been very good at getting these kind of translational drug discovery awards. Um, and with this change in NIH focus, universities have become more willing to hire industrial scientists. I think, as Jeff mentioned, Vanderbilt's probably one of the only places that I think has really done the drug discovery in academia well by, instead of just repositioning existing scientists, went out and hired people with real world drug discovery experience across disciplines to, to do this uh, and to work in big team science, which is so important uh, for the translation to be successful. Uh, we also have a captive audience. Being in Nashville, we're not really uh, in, in, in the pharmaceutical sector of the East Coast. 
So while we do recruit people uh, from there, we also retain strong students and postdocs so that can be absorbed into the program. And then as Jeff mentioned, uh, we're now fully translatable all the way from kind of concept through high throughput screening to developing clinical candidates and even doing uh, early clinical trials. Uh, next slide. Um, to do this obviously requires quite a bit of funding. Um, so here's the, the, just a snapshot of our funding portfolio, uh, fiscal year uh, 2003 through fiscal year 19. Uh, to do this, we pretty much have to have a 10 to $15 million budget annually. Uh, again, Vanderbilt, the School of Medicine is soft money. Uh, so Jeff and I and a couple other faculty raise all this funding annually to do this. Um, we've been fortunate to get a lot of very large grants from the NIH that are not your normal uh, kind of bread and butter uh, grant awards. And then we partner with a lot of foundations and companies. We've been very successful in developing long-term relationships with a, lot of, with a lot of pharmaceutical companies. And just to show how unique Vanderbilt is and the, and the, the Warren Center is, they fund the research here and we're really driving the drug discovery on the ground here at Vanderbilt, not at the company. They fund us through the research. And so just as a flavor for how our deals work, um, Companies license our, our IP up front, the patents that, that uh, have method of treatment claims plus uh, patent on the novel chemical matter. Um, this is really important. And again, Vanderbilt has enabled that by our Center for Technology Transfer has been very good about letting us patent uh, as we see fit and needed to such that when we do enter into relationships, uh, we have intellectual property to license, which obviously benefits the university. And then in, in, uh, along with those, we have three year sponsored research agreements. And so the research again is done here. Uh, new IP that may result rolls into an existing license and then Vanderbilt is eligible for milestone payments. And if a molecule ever makes it all the way to market, uh, royalty streams for the lifetime of the patents. Uh, next slide. So in terms of our output, um, one of the things we've really tried to do is balanced our academic mission with our drug discovery mission. And to that, uh, we've been able to publish over 500 manuscripts since the center started. Uh, and these are all in top tier journals that lead in the field. So really keeping true to our academic mission. And a lot of our publications really become the advertisement for our drug discovery uh, proprietary programs. Uh, I would say a significant portion of what we've published uh, is what led companies to reach out to us to ask if we had something proprietary and would like to collaborate. We also have over 98 issued US patents. Uh, we have over 245 published patent applications. And we're on target this year to file about 30 new patent applications. And we also have one other program right now that's in, uh, we're exchanging term sheets for another license deal on, on another project outside of what Jeff talked about. Uh, next slide. Uh, that's not to say this is not without challenges. Um, obviously funding in a soft money environment um, causes a lot of trepidation and, and we have to be really uh, careful that we always have overlapping tiers of funding. Uh, obviously with the Warren Foundation coming in and endowing the center, that gives us some relief. Um, but again, that's always something that's on our mind. Um, we also have to recruit and retain staff. Uh, that can always happen. Uh, that, that's a big challenge, again, not being in a major pharmaceutical sector. And then uh, there's the things we can't control. Um, early on, we had a couple of programs partnered with Seaside Therapeutics. Then they partnered with another company on a different project, and that eventually killed our program, and then Seaside uh, did no longer existed. Um, we, had, we partnered our Inglu 4 project that Jeff told you about, the Parkinson project, the Bristol-Myers Squibb. Uh, things were going really fantastic. We were moving toward the clinic, and then they got a new head of research, and one of the first decisions they made was to exit neuroscience, along with this other mass exodus from neuroscience. So the project was returned to us, at which point we decided not to partner again, but just to, to develop new, new chemical matter, a new clinical candidate, and then start our own company so we'd have some control over what's happening. Uh, we had a very similar situation to AstraZeneca. They also had budget cuts. They closed their neuroscience center. Program was returned to us. And this is another case uh, outside of the, the 319 story where the Warren Foundation stepped in, uh, funded us for a year to get that program back on track, develop new IP, and then we were able to partner that program again to Lundbeck, and now that's moving toward the clinic. Um, we're always subject to changes in funding priorities of the NIH and elimination of the larger U grants. Uh, obviously, we, we rely on the university to, to shoulder the brunt of a lot of patent costs and additional workload. 
with the idea that when we license a program, we'll reimburse them for those patent costs. Um, there's always time to negotiate term sheets, contracts, uh, and again, in a soft money environment, you always worry about the time it takes to get things moving. Uh, we're always faced with this publication versus patent dilemma. And then for Jeff and I, we really have to wear a lot of hats. Uh, we're not only lab uh, principal investigators, but we also have to be CEOs, CSOs, business development officers. You're doing a lot of different things to keep this moving. And at the same time, we train grad students and postdocs and also have to develop our, our permanent staff that are in the center. So a lot of things, a lot of moving parts. Next slide. So in terms of funding a clinical candidate to first in man, this is something that, as we recall, that is the valley of death. And we were very fortunate that William uh, K. Warren Foundation stepped in and helped us here. Uh, could you advance one click? Yeah. So here's kind of the value of opportunity. And as Jeff showed you in his cartoon, uh, where this valley of death really comes in is where you have a really good clinical development compound. And there's just no way to get the funding to de-risk that to enter human clinical trials. There's very few funding mechanisms that fund what we call these IND enabling studies, invas investigational new drug application studies. However, once you've also de-risked your compound in man and show that it's safe and tolerable and maybe have some early biomarker signs, uh, you've also really increased the value of that asset. Uh, and you've de-risked it significantly that more companies are willing to come in and partner with that asset because it's less likely to fail. Uh, programs can fail in the IND enabling studies where we really do a lot of hardcore toxicology uh, prior to entry in man is, is really significant. And then a lot of compounds fail when you first go into man because they do not have uh, sufficient pharmacokinetics or exposure in the plasma or the brain, or you see some safety signal that causes you to stop. So once you move through those, again, there's value inflection and the, the compound significantly de-risked. So next slide. And one again. So here's the, the again, this bench to bedside abyss. And the way we've addressed it uh, is in this little schematic, which Jeff talked about. So taking observations from clinical data sets, like the deep brain stimulation that Jeff mentioned, identifying pharmacological targets that could be manipulated with small molecules, doing all that basic science, and then going right back out into the clinical setting and now testing a small molecule approach. That's one example. And then the VU319 example that we've alluded to previously is where we also look at a clinical data set with an unselective compound that doesn't have the appropriate selectivity uh, to be safe and effective. And we learn from that, we go back into the basic science and develop fundamentally new pharmacological approaches to selectively modulate a single receptor, then move back into the clinic to show that modulation of that desired single receptor is very effective and safe. And so this is one way we go about uh, picking targets and developing basic science. Uh, we also have just complete de novo approaches, but today we're mainly gonna talk about these, uh, this kind of a pathway from, uh, bedside to bench and back again. Uh, next slide. So these are muscarinic receptors. Um, there are five subtypes. The big take home here is that the, the, the binding site on these receptors that's activated by the endogenous uh, signaling molecule, acetylcholine, is highly conserved. Thus, it's very hard by targeting this, this classical site to get selectivity. So typically, a small molecule will activate or inhibit all five subtypes of this receptor. Uh, the problem there is some of these receptors in the periphery, and if you activate them, they cause uh, a clinical battery known as sludge, which is salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, and really severe gastrointestinal side effects. Um, in the 90s, a lot of different pharmaceutical companies took compounds forward that activated all five subtypes, and while they showed efficacy and cognition, in Alzheimer's patients, they, the, the GI side effects were so severe, all the companies discontinued the programs. And these muscarinic projects were really thought of as, uh, as non-tractable targets after that point. Next slide. Um, the, com the company that, that advanced the furthest was uh, Eli Lilly, and they took a compound forward called xenomaline. Again, this is a compound that activates all five of the muscarinic receptor subtypes. And what they saw was really nice efficacy. Uh, Dose-dependent efficacy across some of the behavioral disturbances in Alzheimer's disease, like delusion, suspiciousness, hallucinations, uh, agitation, threatening, things of this nature. So on the next slide, uh, this led them to go do a small uh, trial in schizophrenic patients. And once again, they saw a, a rapid onset of efficacy, um, and not only against positive symptoms like hallucinations and delusions, but also some of the negative symptoms as well as cognition. 
So, but the compound cannot advance because again, of it, it activating all five subtypes and there, and there being some adverse effects as you push the dose. So one more animation. So the question was, is we need selective tools. Um, we need selective compounds that only activate the M1 receptor subtype and then compounds that only activate the M4 receptor subtype. And then trying to understand which of these is more important for the activity of xenomaline that was noted in patients. So hence began the basic science. Uh, next slide. And so what we did, um, Jeff started this at Merck and he and I worked together at Merck before uh, we both came here which I think is another one of the reasons why the center has been very successful is we, we had a pre-existing relationship of working together. And so what, what came out of this was developing compounds that bind at a, at, a, at a site distinct from the classical orthosteric binding site, which we call allosteric or other sites. And these effectively work as a dimmer switch. So instead of just turning our receptor on or off, we bind at a non-conserved site on the receptor, and we effectively just modulate the gain. We just uh, can can turn the turn the dimmer switch up or down uh, based on what we what we want for a particular program. And because of that, we get exquisite selectivity for one receptor subtype over another. And this is a platform that, that the center has really pioneered for for uh, this form of targets. And this is what made the, the Parkinson project successful. This is what's making these muscarinic projects successful. Uh, next slide. And so what we knew is we, we needed a, an, an, a selective M1 ligand. Uh, it would be required to de-risk uh, studies in man. A lot of companies had taken these unselective ligands and just weren't willing to, to take a shot at it again. And so in our labs, we were able to develop highly selective M1 compounds that had a a, a preferred mode of pharmacology, and we knew that these were going to be successful. And the question was, how do we bridge this chasm between what we developed in the lab and then getting this into patients as a lot of companies that had backed out? Uh, so one more animation. So this is where um, the, the Warren family had funded my endowed chair, and when I was in Tulsa giving a talk shortly after that, at the end of my talk where I was discussing these muscarinic receptors, Bill Warren stood up and just said, what would you do if I gave you a million dollars, five million, 10 million? And I was take, taking it back because no, no one's ever asked me that. Um, and what I said was, well, we would take forward some of these projects that we really have to de-risk in the IND enabling toxicology where we do, we do toxic uh, studies for toxicology in rats, dogs, non-human primates, and, and then take it all the way into humans to show that it is safe and effective. And uh, they did that. So they funded three programs in the center so far, in addition to the endowment. And their funding here was really critical in bridging this gap. Uh, next slide. So I know a lot of folks aren't chemists on the phone, but I'll basically just, just let you the Our original hit from the high throughput screen is the molecule shown here. Uh, this was a compound that was not, a, not selective right out of our screen. It, did, it wasn't selective exclusively for the M1 receptor subtype. And it also had some functionality on it that is something if I had worked at Merck, we would not have been able to work on. Uh, it's reactive and, and it just wouldn't have been a, a, something we'd, we'd go on with. However, it had, the, it had the appropriate pharmacology mode that we knew was gonna be effective and safe in man. So chemists love challenges, we took that and we said, well, we can just fix all these issues. Uh, so animation. Uh, one change gave us a, a different subtype selective compound. Uh, another animation. Um, we found some other chemistry that then dialed in the selectivity for the receptor we needed. And one more animation. Another one. Uh, then we started making better compounds with better properties. And another arrow. Uh, we started moving mo uh, these header atoms around the, the molecule just to improve physical properties, which led to a really important tool compound, which is something that is really important for us in an academic environment. Because we can do a lot of work with this tool count, tool compound, both internally, send it to, to other collaborators across the world, and really find out what our mechanism is capable of and how safe and effective it is in other people's hands. So one more animation. Uh, that then let additional chemistry led us to a clinical candidate. And then the Warren family came in, and with their, their funding, we're able to do the 16-month odyssey of manufacturing this drug on kilogram scales, determining uh, doses in different animals, doing 28-day toxicology studies, 
um, developing a drug form and a drug product. In this case, they were gel capsules. Uh, all the report writing, filing the IND, submitting the IND to the FDA. And then, next slide. Uh, we, were able, we were given an open IND and permission to proceed uh, into the clinic. And then we were able to do, with uh, funding from the Alzheimer's Association that uh, Paul Newhouse, a, a clinical collaborator at VUMC, was able to get, we were able to complete the single ascending dose study, both fed and fasted with this compound. So next uh, animation. Uh, there's its registry number on clinicaltrials.gov. And the next animation is just, this was our, our first example of taking a clinical data set, bringing it back into the lab, overhauling it and figuring out what we need to do, and then taking it right back into the clinic again with great success. So next slide. Oh, and then we partnered with Acadia. So here's just some of the, the key outcomes. Um, so in a phase one study, we recruit normal volunteers, healthy folks. And all we're trying to look and see is does the compound have the appropriate exposure and is it safe? Uh, there's really, this isn't an efficacy trial at this point. But we were very pleased to see that um, by going after a selective molecule with the right properties, we saw excellent safety with no side effects. Um, we saw no significant or dose-related adverse events. There is no evidence of behavioral toxicity or behavioral adverse events, which would be indicative of these, these older pan uh, ligands that were not selective. The human PK, pharmacokinetics, supported once daily dosing orally, so we'd be able to have an oral pill. Um, but then we did do some, some studies to look at target engagement. And so uh, Dr. Newhouse was able to show or had some evidence for target engagement with enhancement of memory-related, uh, event-related potentials. We saw impact on psychomotor speed as well as working memory at our highest doses, which this is really exciting because in healthy volunteers, they have normal tone of this receptor. Uh, whereas in disease states like Alzheimer's and schizophrenia, it's diminished, so our, our compound is expected to work better uh, in disease patients versus healthy volunteers. So this is really exciting and gives a lot of uh, excitement about this program and this target as it moves with Acadia into phase two clinical trials, which will be testing efficacy in patients. Next slide. And as Jeff showed you a pipeline of our late stage assets, we, we have a similar uh, pipeline of future programs. And again, this is really pretty broad. We're working in a lot of different realms. Um, we, you know, we have some, some consistent themes of Parkinson's, epilepsy, schizophrenia, cognition, um, but there's a lot going on. And, and these early programs are funded both by corporations, foundations, uh, NIH. Some of these will lead to just publications and they won't go any further because they don't really have, they're not druggable targets. They don't have potential to, to continue. Other programs are really going to rise up and be really clear that these should become drug discovery projects, and then they'll flip onto our, our other pipeline chart. And next slide. I think that's it. Yep. So that's it. Uh, we're happy to take your guys' questions. Well, <coughs> thank you very much, very much Greg, 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 Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really <laughs> impressive presentation. I'm going to turn it back over to Taylor now, who will moderate the question and answer session. Taylor? Anyway, and thank you, Jeff and Craig. That was a really spectacular, very interesting, um, you know, presentation about the work that you guys do every day in the one for neuroscience drug discovery. Um, first question here, I'd like to ask you guys: uh, What are drug treatments under investigation for autism? Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I'm getting a lot of echo. Mute until we're talking. Uh, so, so this is actually a really exciting area that's developing. So, autism, uh, there have been no really good effective treatments. There are a couple of drugs that are on the market that are uh, approved for treatment of, of individuals with autism or autistic spectrum disorders, uh, aripiprazole and risperidone, uh, but they have very limited effects in in uh, patients who are agitated and it's really just for the outburst. We're starting to learn a lot more about the mechanisms uh, that underlie the disease and so there are new efforts that are coming from that. Uh, outside of the WCNDD, there have been some really interesting clinical studies recently reported. One reported January this year just came out uh, with a drug called metamide or bumetanide, sorry, uh, and, and this is a drug that's on the market used for treatment of edemia. 
uh, edema, and it inhibits a chloride transporter. So, so it basically has effects in edema through uh, reducing uh, the excessive fluid through that transporter. But it turns out that that same transporter is involved in a developmental switch in uh, in the brain that uh, changes the activity of a neurotransmitter called GABA from an excitatory to an inhibitory effect. And so learning that uh, led to some studies with this approved drug that showed robust efficacy, at least in an early study. So I don't want to overstate that. It's one study that's just come out, but nonetheless very encouraging. But it's a good example of understanding something about the biology, what's happening in development, and then moving a new drug forward. Within the C and DD, we have some really exciting projects. Uh, one is a receptor called MGLU7 that Colleen Nicewinder, who is our director of molecular pharmacology, a real leader in the center, uh, has, has pioneered this area in showing that this receptor is altered in Rett syndrome patients. Uh, and then by uh, working with Craig and, and you know, the unique facilities we have being able to develop compounds that have effects in, uh, in animal models, especially in this case for Rett syndrome, uh, which is an autistic spectrum disorder, but the hope is that it could have utility outside of that. And then another internal program is uh, MGLU5 NAM program, which was on one of those lists. And there are a lot of studies emerging that suggest that MGLU5 NAMs may have effects in autistic spectrum disorders. It started out with Fragile X, uh, but now that has been expanded to other autistic spectrum disorders where there's potential. So, so there are things that are moving along. Those are very early, so, uh, so, so it would be many years before you would actually see those go into and through development. I don't know if Craig wants to add to that with other programs. There are other things that we have in the Warren Center that I think have potential. No, that was pretty, that was, that was good. A uh, lot of other treatments are being developed around the world, but they're all pretty early. Right. So in, in that same vein, um, you know, a question that just came in, uh, what is the purpose of doing research just for publication? Uh, is it financially stable? Uh, will publication research lead to drug treatments? Um, yeah, so I, I think for us, publications are really important. Um, one thing that we can point to is publications that we put out with tool molecules, where we really did the first early target validation for a novel target for schizophrenia, say like, or the MGLU5 NAMs and models of Fragile X syndrome. Um, it was great for us. It encouraged other people at other companies to launch programs. Uh, there is some degree of de-risking that our work does. And so for us being a university setting, it's, you know, if our compound is a molecule that ultimately becomes a drug, that's a win. But if the basic science we put out encourages a Merck or a Pfizer or a Lilly to start a program and they develop a drug that you can tie back to the basic science out of Vanderbilt, uh, that's also a win. Great. Thank you, Craig. Uh, one question here, uh, getting a lot of questions around particular diseases, um, so I thought I'd, I'd ask this one since you, we did spend so much time discussing Parkinson's. Are, are there any promising drugs for Parkinson's and does the average patient have access to them or do they have to be in a clinical trial? Uh, all of the drugs that are currently available are variations on the thing that has been around for a long time. So uh, dopamine replacement therapies, and there are a lot of new formulations that can even the exposure to uh, L-DOPA, uh, like Duodopa and other approaches. And that really does provide a, a major benefit, but everything that is currently available for patients, uh, you know, there, there are some uh, other, uh, exceptions like compounds that have a modest effect on dyskinesia, et cetera. But for the most part, the currently available drugs are variations on a thing that's been around for a long time. There are a lot of drugs and new approaches that are in development. So we mentioned one, the MGLU4 PAMS. Uh, we're really excited about that. Another company, uh, Lundbeck, has it, its own MGLU4 PAM program. Uh, and then there are other programs within the WCNDD that are at a much earlier stage. Uh, 
But at this point, those programs are in uh, preclinical or about to enter phase one, we hope. And, and so it will be a while before they reach patient trials and then patients would have to enter clinical trials. Uh, and the same is true for most of the programs that are out there. So a company called Denali, for instance, has LERC2 inhibitors. It, LERC is just an enzyme that has been implicated in Parkinson's disease. And it's a very exciting uh, program in that if it's effective, it could reduce the progression of the disease. But at this point, it is fully experimental. So you would have to be involved in clinical trials uh, to have the ability to, to have access or be tested with that drug. And obviously, for any of those that are still in clinical trials, we don't know ultimately uh, what the efficacy will be. Great. Well, you know, you mentioned, uh, you guys both mentioned a few times that you're in a space that a lot of drug companies have decided it's too risky to be in, uh, and, and they've kind of backed out of that. Uh, but what do you guys do to minimize your risk of, of failure, and how are those? How are your attempts different than than what uh, others are doing? So Craig, well, you want to yeah, I think the most the best answer to that is the deep basic science. So we may spend, you know, uh, a normal NIH grant gives us five years to work on a problem, and we may spend in certain cases, five or 10 years working on a target that we think is really important and has value uh, to really get into the, uh, all the real, the caveats about it and how to engage it appropriately to give a, a give us appropriate efficacy and safety. And you know, when, we're, when we were both at Merck and it's still the same today, when they launch a program, they may only have 18 months to two years to go from start to finish before they're reassigned to another project. So in one sense, they kind of have to put on blinders and just follow whatever asset they have available, get to the end point. But then there's all this stuff on the periphery that's so important and determines whether or not you're going to be successful. And they don't always have the time uh, to investigate those deeply enough. That's definitely the case with M1. We've seen multiple people, multiple companies beat us to the clinic, but they didn't spend the time to really understand the, the basic science around this, this target and they ended up failing in development. And these are things we, our basic science identified and we were able to sidestep it and uh, get a safe and effective compound in the clinic. Fantastic. Uh, question here about uh, your collaborations on campus. Uh, do, so do you guys cooperate with other departments on campus and, and how do students uh, get into your lab to, to work in your, in your space? We have a lot of collaborations on campus. I mean, the, th the wonderful thing about Vanderbilt and one of the things that uh, makes this possible here, and I really do think it's uh, what we do is only possible in the way we do it, a, a very small number of institutions. And it's not just infrastructure, it's, it's uh, culture. And, and Vanderbilt's a very collaborative, uh, big science culture. They're, they're willing to take risk. And so, so that kind of pervades the entire university. Then we have uh, things like the, the 319 program uh, that Craig outlined, you know, the collaboration with the Clinical Research Center, the collaboration with psychiatry. Uh, you know, we have a lot of collaborations where the Imaging Center Institute has uh, been key to being able to develop biomarkers. So we collaborate extensively across campus on our major top priority programs. Uh, and then there are other collaborations that are more basic science related for programs that may be percolating along. And, and Craig is involved in a lot of those collaborations with other individuals that are developing new compounds for targets that they've been studying for uh, quite some time but may not have the tools. And so uh, when Craig showed that list of the earlier programs, a lot of those would represent those types of collaborations. Yeah, I think we're also very fortunate at Vanderbilt to have a world-class imaging facility. So we do a lot of imaging for biomarkers for target engagement. Uh, so we collaborate with VUMC and, and um, the imaging center to, to do uh, sleep-wake architecture. We make pet tracers, occupancy studies, things of that nature. But um, Vanderbilt has so many unique resources that we take advantage of. And as, as Larry mentioned, the, the core system 
the high throughput screening core, the metabolic core. There's so many other groups and facilities that we collaborate with to get data we need to make decisions. Great. Thanks, Jeff and Craig. I'll ask one last question here. I want to be respectful of everybody's time before we wrap up here at 3 p.m. But, uh, you know, you guys just got this wonderful gift from the Warren Foundation. Uh, that is really, you know, giving you guys a, a big endowment to to go after some some really interesting targets. Maybe if you could uh, build on that a little bit, share us share with us the, your vision for the future of the Warren Center. We we covered what you've done in the past, but what do you, what do you see the future now that you you've received this great gift and, and have um, some great successes uh, on the board? You know, this the gift and just provides a stability that uh, Craig mentioned that is so critical for us to be able to plan and implement. So right now, as we're partnered with multiple companies for multiple programs, one thing that we have found with that model is that our success can also lead to uh, uh, real stress. So, so uh, we can think of one year where we had uh, two major partnerships with companies that were very successful. We reached our milestones, uh, got a compound that the company was able to advance into development. And for us, that stops the program. So, so there's no more funding. It just so happened that that occurred at the same time that some large center grants uh, ended and they were similar grants where they had a finite end. They're, they were not something that could be renewed. And so, it was one of those cases where it was one of our most successful years ever to date, and yet uh, our success actually led to a loss of funding, and that's how it, it was supposed to be. Uh, what this provides is a stability to allow us to plan ahead. So it's very difficult to plan for what the next things will be when we know there's this cliff coming and, and we, we can't make those plans. So right now, uh, we are continuing to invest in a lot of the same areas that we've been investing in, but very fundamentally new approaches. And that's what's key to everything we do is it's all fundamentally new. It would offer a, a, a real change in the standard of care for patients. We have new programs that are focused on PTSD, on addictive disorders. We have some really exciting programs for uh, depression, for major depression. And we're uh, already uh, being contacted by companies. Uh, what the companies see the, the basic science. So the publications, getting back to that question, they see the publications where we have really developed this new insight. And so we're being uh, approached by some of those next stage programs. With the, the uh, Warren uh, Center gift, it allows us to think of those programs, where are the biggest needs, the greatest opportunities, and really invest so that we don't have to say the moment uh, you know, this program ends, then, then the funding is turned off. We're able to use that money strategically to then build those next programs and get them over the hump until we partner with another, another company and bring them that major source of funding. So, so it just allows us to do things that we may have uh, may have languished otherwise. New areas like the rep program, uh, you've, we've got to have the money to invest in the next uh, seri series of studies before we can move that forward. And yet, it would be a huge impact on the community. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Craig, and everybody for joining us today. Um, we will be posting this video online on YouTube. Uh, we will make sure that you get a link of that so you can go back and review any sections um, that you'd like to, and you can also share with friends and family. Uh, thank you again for joining us today, and look, be on the lookout for more uh, exciting uh, webinars from Basic Sciences of Vanderbilt. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.